Hello, good morning. My name is Dave and I'm part of the leadership at Gold Hill. And it's my uh, role and my privilege this morning to be sharing with you a little bit uh, from, from the Bible, um, answering a question that really a lot of us are asking in one way or another at the minute about how we step out of lockdown, how it is that we emerge from lockdown. And we uh, kicked off last week a little series that we've been doing um, called Stepping Out, and it gives six tips for coming out of lockdown. And last week we were looking at not being afraid as we come out of lockdown. And today we're looking at another thing. Um, and we've been doing this by, by, by looking at a story in the Bible, uh, which gives some really kind of practical advice, actually, when we dig underneath it a little bit, that, that speaks to, to what was going on then for them, but it really speaks to what's going on now for us as well. It was the people of God as they were coming out of 40 years in a, in a wilderness place. They were literally in the desert, in the wilderness, wandering around for 40 years, not really going anywhere. They were kind of trapped there and stuck there, constrained and restricted, much like we've been during this lockdown in a way. And then this is the story of them emerging from that and coming into the, the promised land that they'd been told that they were going to have, the place that was going to become their home. But, but that transition, getting from one place to the other, wasn't easy and it wasn't simple and it wasn't comfortable for them. And this transition period for us is, is, is also not very comfortable and not very easy. It's not a simple thing. And at the minute, I'm sure you, like me, are getting lots of things from lots of different places, sharing what, what different people's plans are for coming out of lockdown, for emerging. We've heard government's plans. I'm sure you've heard from businesses that, you, that you're involved with, whether that be shops or cafes or restaurants or pubs. You've seen on social media different places, hairdressers and barbers and, and, and shopkeepers all sharing what, what their plans are what it is that, that things are going to happen like now. Churches are doing the same thing. Just this week, uh, we sent out and we, we published through our, through our website and via an email what our plan as a church is, what the different stages are that we are planning to go through as we emerge from lockdown. And today's uh, tip, today's uh, kind of uh, encouragement for all of us as we come out of lockdown is simply this. It's make a plan. That's what we're looking at today, uh, the idea of making a plan that can be a guide for us as we seek to emerge from lockdown. So I want to um, carry on looking at this passage. I just want to read the very first bit, the very first sort of sentence of this story that we're looking at today and then say a few words about what was going on then and what that might mean for us now. So it starts like this. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go. Look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So the, the story starts off very simply. The people aren't in the land yet. They're still out in the wilderness, but they're, they're looking to enter. And the first thing that, that Joshua does after he sort of has roused the people and told them not to be fearful last week. Now what he does is he, he sends out a couple of spies. He sends out two spies into the land to go and sort of scope it out a little bit. And the first thing um, that I think we see in terms of making a plan is this, scope it out. We need to scope out what it is that lies ahead of us, work out what the territory is, figure out what's going on. I said that lots of companies and organisations and churches and families and individuals are making plans for what it's going to look as, as we transition out. Underlying a lot of those plans is something that, that I want to talk about. And before I do, because I'm going to put a graphic up on the screen in a moment, and when you see it, you might think, oh my word, I'm switching off, this is going to be boring as anything. Can I encourage you to stay on just for a moment, hear me out just for a little bit, because I want to talk to you about risk assessments. That's right, stick with me folks for a minute. So risk assessments are so important at the minute. And all kinds of organisations and schools and everyone is doing risk assessments to work out what can be done and what can't be done and what needs to be done to make sure it happens safely. And there are lots of different ways of doing risk assessments and different templates that people follow. But here are some things that you find often in a risk assessment. You'll, you'll identify a, a, a hazard. There'll be, there'll be something that is potentially dangerous, something bad that could happen. Then, when you think about that hazard, you've also got to ask, how severe is it? What's the severity of that hazard? How serious would it be if it happened? What would be the ramifications? What would be the impact? How bad would it be? Then, you think about the likelihood. Okay, so it might be really bad or it might not be too bad, but is it, is it likely to happen? Is it very likely? Is it definite? Is it impossible? What's the, what's the likelihood of this happening? 
And then once you've worked that all out, you can work out, is it serious and very likely to happen? Because if it's both of those things, then you really need to do something about it. And you have to ask, what will you do? So, for example, I could identify it as a hazard that talking about risk assessments in a message might get people to be bored and switch off. That's the hazard, bored people. I think, how severe is that? How serious is that? Well, I'd be a little bit sad if people switched off and didn't listen to the rest of what I had to say. So, yeah, it's a bit serious. How likely is it? Well, it's risk assessments, so potentially quite likely. So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to start off with a light-hearted, humorous introduction and hope people will bear with me. More seriously, though, today there are all kinds of things that we're trying to figure out. Because in the sort of hazard column here, in, 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 the, in the dangers of what might be happening, we've got all kinds of things ranging from, from physical health, the, the danger of, of catching COVID-19 or of passing it on to other people. We, we've got that. We've got risks and hazards to do with our mental health. Lockdown has been hard on mental health for many, many, many people. There are also questions of financial security. For, for us as a nation, the economy is, is definitely weighing into the decisions that are being made by government, and, and that makes some sense. But also for us as individuals, when we think about what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do, what positions we're willing to put, into our, put ourselves into and what we're not, some of those have financial implications if it involves work or if it involves all kinds of different things. So there's all kinds of different hazards that we're kind of trying to, trying to balance and then we end up weighing those against one another. What if something is, is good for my sort of financial security but dangerous for my health? Or what if something is good for my health but potentially bad for my, for, 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 for my well-being and for my, for my mental health? It may be good for my physical health but what about that other important part of who I am? So we have all of these maybe sometimes conflicting hazards and then we've got to sort of figure out which ones are serious and which ones are likely to, to, to be damaged. And, and it can become very confusing. But the important thing with that risk assessment is that we figure out what it is that we're going to do in order to try and decrease that risk or in order to try and manage it. And so for these people, Joshua sent out these spies. For, for them, their, their, their risk was that they would lose, that they would go into this, into this land and they would get defeated by the people who were there, that they would get kicked out or they would get killed. That was the hazard. Was it, was it a severe, was it a serious hazard if it happened? Yes, that would be very serious, that would be catastrophic. Is it likely? Well, these are people who are in an established place. It is, humanly speaking, pretty likely that they would lose. So what are they going to do about it? Well, one thing Joshua did is he sends out spies. He goes and scopes it out to figure out what's going on. And particularly, he says, go look over the land. He said, especially Jericho. Now, Jericho was the first city they were going to see. It was one that was near the border. And really, if they could win in Jericho, if they could manage to take Jericho, then the rest of the, the land might start to open up. But if they lost in Jericho, it would be catastrophic. And so he, he specifically says, well, if we're going to try and manage this risk, then we really need to understand what's going on there. So go there first. Go and scope out the whole land, yes, but, but focus in on the thing that you know is going to be an issue. And so he sends them to Jericho. And in the rest of this passage and the rest of what I want to look at, really there are two things that we see happen when they go to Jericho that also help us as we make our plans as well. So let me carry on reading. In fact, I'm going to read from the beginning and see what the first thing that happened when they got to Jericho was. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. So the first thing that we see as, as we see what happened in Jericho is they were scoping out what lay ahead of them. The first sort of lesson I think we learn from this is to know who your allies are. You see, these spies who've been sent out into the land, I want to be clear, they're not particularly good spies. 
they've been told to go, keep themselves sort of keep, keep under the wire and sort of make, make sure no one sees that they're theirs, make sure no one spots them. So they go and maybe they, they, they go into the house of this prostitute Rahab to kind of stay a little bit under the radar. Um, sort of official people might not want to be around there. So they're kind of keeping their distance and trying to, trying to not get noticed. But for whatever reason, it hasn't worked. Because no, no sooner have they entered the, the city of Jericho and gone to this house and met Rahab, uh, the king of Jericho, the king of the whole place, gets, gets wind and hears that they're there. And he knows exactly where they're from and he knows exactly what they're doing. Whatever methods these guys are using to spy, they're not doing a particularly good job. And so we end up in this situation where their fate kind of rests in the hands of this woman, Rahab. And Rahab has two options. She can completely throw them under the bus. She can uh, say, yep, they're up there. Um, th this, is, this is how you get to them. Have at it. Go and arrest them. Go kill them. Do whatever it is that you want to do. Or she can do what she actually does. She keeps them safe. She, she ends up being someone that they can trust. And at the minute, in our lives, the people around us, the, whether that's individual people we know, whether that's organisations, whether that's uh, people we're involved in, whether that's movements, whether that's whatever it is, they can do one of two things. They can help us or they can not help us. And at the minute, one of the things that can be difficult for us is to figure out, who should I be listening to? Who is it that that I can trust at the minute. That might be particular individuals who we know. There might be people you know and you're thinking, actually, do they have my best interests at heart? Should I be listening to them? Should I be trusting them? Or it could be sort of, um, which, which scientists do I listen to? Or which news outlets do I listen to? Or which celebrities do I listen to? Or which political figures do I listen to? Who is it that I can trust? Where is it that I can, that I can turn? Who are you listening to at the minute? Who is it that you're getting advice from? For the, for the maybe smaller things like, should I go out or should I not go out? Or should I wear a face mask or should I not wear a face mask? Or what about meetings in public and how many people and should I have people in my house or just in my garden? Or whatever the questions are for us, where are you going to for your advice for those things? Are you talking amongst your friends and figuring out what other people are doing? That can be a good thing to do because presumably your friends have your best interests at heart. Family can be the same, although sometimes we find that people aren't necessarily thinking through things properly and we, we shouldn't be necessarily trusting what they're saying. But then when it comes to the sort of bigger, maybe sort of faceless organisations and different things and things that we read in the media, whether that be in mainstream media or social media or whatever it is that we find, how do we, how do we work out who to listen to? Really the question comes down to who is it that's trustworthy? Who is it that has your best interests at heart? If today is all about making a plan and we can scope out the territory and see what lies ahead of us, see what kind of issues it is we might be facing, we then need to figure out how to focus on those issues and how to, how to manage them, how to negotiate them. One thing I'd really encourage you to do is not to try and do that on your own. Because it, there can be a temptation for lots of us to, to, to think, well, I don't need to listen to anyone about this. I don't need to read anything or find out anything or manage any kind of risk or listen to anyone else. I can, I can figure out the answers for myself. And so we kind of batten down the hatches and just try and go our own way and we shut other people out. I, don't, I want to encourage you not to do that. Maybe that you think, well, I need to appear strong for other people and I need to, I need to make this my own, my own decision and not listen to other people. But actually, appearing strong can actually lead us to be weak. See, if these spies had ultimately decided to just go it alone and not, not trust anyone, not rely on anyone, well, we saw how bad spies they were. They wouldn't have got very far. They ended up in this place where their fates were, were tied in with what Rahab would do, and it turns out she was trustworthy. It turns out they could trust her. They could rely on her. She would actually become quite a big part of eventually when Jer Jericho is, uh, is defeated and when, the, when God's people do end up taking it. Rahab's involved in that little bit of the story as well. Rahab proves that she's trustworthy, that she can be relied on, that she has their interests at heart. We'll read in a few moments some words from Rahab herself. But I want to encourage you to think, as you're making plans, who is it that you're going to listen to? Are they reliable? Do they have your best interests at heart? Are they just hoping to get something from you? Think about it. Try and figure it out. Ask for advice. 
but make sure that when you're asking for advice, you're asking for advice from people who can really give you good advice. It can be really hard to sift that kind of thing through and work out where exactly the advice you're, you're getting is coming from. But I encourage you to try. I'd encourage you to know who your allies are in all of this and to trust them and to stick with them and to let them stick with you. But as we carry on, we're going to come to another thing that can help us as we try to make plans. We're going to carry on reading. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city walls. She said, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. So this, this woman, who's turned out to be an ally and who has proven to be someone who is trustworthy, who they can rely on, she then speaks. And before they go and before she gives them a bit more advice about how to continue to evade these people who are pursuing them, she speaks and she talks not just about them and about their situation or about herself. She talks about their God. She talks about the God who they follow, the God who I also follow. And she speaks about this God in such elevated and big ways. She starts talking about how everyone in this city is actually terrified because they've heard what it is that, that this God has done in the past. This, this God who was able to, to part waters and, and split the whole, of a, the whole of the Red Sea so the people could walk through on dry land as they were escaping people that were pursuing them. Talks about um, hearing what they've done to other nations and other kings who've ended up being defeated by this nation. She, she talks about these things and she says, we've heard that and we know that you're now sort of coming into land that we are in and we're scared. See, she... Not they, but she bring, brings God into it. And actually, later on, when, when the spies go, go back to Joshua and sort of share what they've seen, this is what they say. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Notice that for these two spies and for Rahab, it's not just about them making their own plans and seeing who has the best plan and seeing who can follow through the best. See, the, the final thing that I want to talk about really is that one thing we can do as we're making plans that I think is really good is to get God in your plans. Make sure that God has a place in there. You might be thinking, well, I'm not sure if I want God to have a place in my plans. I'd prefer to work things out myself. I don't know what I think about this God. But I want to encourage you that if, if, if you imagine that sort of risk assessment before, then whether the problem, whether the hazard is being defeated by the people of Jericho or whether the hazard is catching COVID-19. Whether we think that that is a really uh, sort of serious thing that could happen, like it definitely would have been uh, for the people, or whether we think it would be a slightly less serious thing, whatever, wherever we are on that sort of serious factor, however likely we think those things are to happen, whether we think it's likely and we're, we're quite nervous about catching that or about other things in our life um, not going well, or whether we actually think it's very unlikely. Yeah, sure, other people might struggle, but, but I'm doing fine. Wherever we are on all of those spectrums, whatever the hazard is, no matter how likely we think it is, no matter how serious we think it is, I want to encourage you that one thing we can always do about it is to involve God, to place God in that, in that box of, what are we going to do? What's the plan? What will you do about it? What do I mean by that? Well, maybe I could put it like this. 
Is prayer part of your risk assessment? The plans that you're making, the things that you're deciding or not deciding or deciding to, to wait until you make a decision, is God part of that? Is prayer part of that? I guess, speaking to, to people who would call themselves a Christian for a moment, have you prayed about the decisions that you're making? Have you, have you submitted them to God? Have you said, actually, God, I want to know what you think about this. Can you speak to me about it? And have you taken the time to listen to God about that? Maybe speaking to a moment for people who wouldn't call themselves Christians or for whom church is a very new thing or something that you're just sort of exploring now at the minute. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. I want, to, I want to be really clear about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Because what I'm not saying is that, well, if you just put prayer in there as the what will you do, if you put God in there, then everything else gets wiped away. As if suddenly we don't actually need risk assessments. We just need to pray and everything will be fine. Because if we pray, then it's a, it's a simple thing. And every time we pray, everything works out perfectly. There might be people who are saying, why are you, being, why, why are you taking so long to open up your buildings again? Why, why are you doing all these risk assessments? If we pray, then surely nothing bad will happen when we come and gather. There might be people who are thinking that. I don't, I don't share that view. I don't agree with that. Because prayer and God is not some kind of get out of COVID free card that we can play and just immediately be safe from everything. But God, as we see in, in, in this passage and the way that he related to the people of Israel and, and the city of Jericho, it's also true for us that God goes ahead of us and God, God will both go before us and be with us. And so no matter what other kind of th mitigations we put in place, no matter, no matter what other things we put in place to try and decrease the likelihood or decrease the seriousness or decrease the risk overall, no matter what it is that we're doing as we're making plans, let's definitely involve God in them. Because God is bigger than anything we might find in any of those other parts of it. God is bigger than us. God is bigger than the situations we find ourselves in. And he can go ahead of us. It doesn't guarantee perfect protection all of the time. Things can still be difficult. Things can still be rocky. They are often. But God will be there. He'll be with us. He'll be going ahead of us. He'll be preparing us. We are definitely better off stepping into this whole time with God than we are without him. And he wants to be part of us making our plans. He wants to share with us his plans for us. He wants to guide us. He wants to be close to us. If you're listening, I want to say to you that, that God has plans for you. God has purposes for you. You may not know them. You may not know him. But I want to say to you that I believe God has a purpose and he has plans for you. And he wants to show you what they are. So as you're making your plans, can I encourage you to get God into them? Get God in them, allow him to be part of your decision making and allow him to speak into them. He loves to do that in all kinds of different ways. And you might be thinking, God couldn't be interested in me. God's not interested in my plans and what's going on for me. I'm, I'm just me. I'm insignificant or I'm small or I'm pretty messy and things aren't great for me and there's lots of things about me that I know aren't right and you might be right about those things. That might describe who you are. I want to come back to that character of Rahab for a minute. Rahab was not part of God's people at the beginning of this story. Rahab was someone who was part of the, the foreign nation that they were going to, they were going to um, go to war with, they were going to defeat. She was also a prostitute. No little girl grows up wanting to be a prostitute with her life. Her life was messy. Things in her life weren't good. Things had led to this point where this was the option, the only option she felt she had, and that was her life. It was messy. It was messed up. It was broken. This isn't the last time we hear about Rahab in the Bible. And actually, when we come to the, to, to the defeat of Jericho, isn't the last time we hear about Rahab in the Bible either. Centuries later, when Jesus was born, one of the writers in the New Testament records Jesus' family tree, his lineage, his genealogy. There are mostly men mentioned in that list. There are a few women, and Rahab is one of them. Rahab, who wasn't Jewish, wasn't part of the quote-unquote right people, wasn't part of the club. 
didn't have a polished, easy, nice, smooth life. Did God have a plan for her? You bet he did. Did God still have purposes for her? Absolutely. So much so that he was willing to entrust not just the, the taking over of Jericho to this woman, but he was willing to entrust to her part of the family tree that would lead to Jesus when God himself stepped into the world. You might think that you're a million miles away from being acceptable to God. I want to encourage you that you're not. I want to encourage you that he absolutely wants to be part of your life and he absolutely wants to be involved in your plans. So as you're making plans, as you're deliberating and deciding what it is that you will do and won't do, I want to encourage you to scope it out and have an honest view of what it is that lies ahead of you and where the risks are, where the opportunities are as well. I want to encourage you also to know who your allies are, know who it is that you can listen to and trust. And get God into your plans. If you've never prayed before, give it a try. Of course, there comes a point when our decision making has to kind of be final and we have to do something about it. This isn't actually the first time in the Bible that, that the people have sent spies into this land. It's the second time. The previous time, it was actually 12 spies, not, not, not two. And 10 of them came back and said, this is too scary, we can't do it. And the other two came back and said, God is going to go ahead of us. We can trust him, we can go. The people at the time listened to the wrong people. And they didn't go. And they spent 40 years wandering. One thing we can't do is just deliberate and deliberate and deliberate. At some point we have to make a step. And next week actually, as we see what happens next in this story, we see the people make a step. And we're going to ask what it means for us to make a step as well. But for now I just want to pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you can be trusted. Thank you that you are an ally. Thank you that you can see the big picture even when we can't. You can see what lies ahead. You can see where the dangers are. You can see where the opportunities are. Thank you that you see ahead of us and that you want to go ahead of us. I ask that you'd help us all as we're making difficult decisions, almost daily sometimes it seems. Lord, would you help us? Would you guide us? Every single one of us. Thank you that you've given us minds. Thank you that you've given us other people. And I ask that you would encourage us, that you would lead us and that you would shape us as we make our plans and as we seek to find out what your plans are. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.